Okay, there we go. Okay, yes, sorry. Hi, y'all. Uh, I <laughs> thought we had a little snafu there, but we are good. We are back for another Wellbeing Wednesday. So again, welcome back if you have been here with us before. And if not, welcome for the very first time. Uh, just a quick background on what this is. This is a monthly segment that shows child care providers and caregivers like yourselves simple ways to support your own well-being. So because taking care of ourselves really is how we can help take care of others. So whether you're in early childhood education, whether you're a director, an admin parent, or someone who just feels like a parent, sometimes me, um, you're sure to pick up tidbits of actionable advice and how to support your overall well-being and get back to feeling like yourself. So I'm your host, Susanna Creed. I am with Be Well Care Well Arkansas, which is a curricula concepts program that's all about supporting the well-being of child care providers. And that's what helped bring Wellbeing Wednesday into fruition and to you all. So before we dive right in with our amazing guest, who I will introduce in just a second, um, our September theme, you all know, we use the eight dimensions of wellness and to really take a holistic view of our overall well-being. So this theme is all about rediscovering our purpose and connection to something greater than ourselves. So this falls typically into the spiritual dimension of wellness. Spiritual can include faith, religion, God, higher power, and that's wonderful if that connects for you. And it can also include so many other things. That's part of why this theme was called, what's your why? Because what is your purpose? What, it, what gives you purpose and meaning in your life? And what is something that's bigger than just me, myself, and I that can help give me that purpose? So that might be, like I said, it could be faith, could be religion. It could also be my community, my family, my friends, my profession. It's whatever gives me that purpose and drive and connection to something bigger. Mm -hmm. So I'm super excited to welcome our guest, Claire Hodgson here. She is a certified yoga instructor and personal trainer. So yes, all of those things do relate to spiritual wellness. We are just bursting all the bubbles today on that. Um, <laughs> So during her graduate studies, yoga actually deepened into a philosophical and spiritual practice for her that really transcended just the postures that she had been practicing since her teens. It became a way to nurture her mental health and better relate to others around her while finding a deeper connection with her body. So finding that connection in different ways. Her intention as a yoga teacher and as a personal trainer is to create the same space for others to observe and find themselves in their own practice. So Claire, thank you so much for joining today. We have all heard enough from me, but I want to kind of kick it to you and, and just start us off with kind of your take maybe on spiritual wellness and kind of how for you, because it sounds like for you, yoga was a way to connect spiritually. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and your own experiences with it. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. And as a former elementary educator, I just appreciate the service that you're offering so much because I know not only how difficult it is to be in that field, but also how hard it can be, whether you're a caregiver or an educator, to find the time to take for yourself to explore these themes. So thank you for providing this service for people. And you're right, yoga is the way that I really was able to connect to myself and to connect to this higher level of myself, whatever that means for people. And I think like you already touched on, higher self can look like faith and religion. It can look like a movement practice. And I think the key thing for myself and what I see in others is finding the space to examine ourselves and to move forward with what we find in that space. And by space, I really mean quiet and being in the yeah. body, <laughs> which is something that's really hard to come by in this day and age. And that was why yoga was such a revolutionary practice to me. I'm a very type A do, do, do person. Many of us are, I relate. right? I relate. <laughs> it's kind of hard to be in this field um, and not have that kind of personality. So for me, I had lived most of my life and my early 20s, and then my later 20s now, I'll be 30 next year, very excited. And so there was a lot of my early 20s that was really just lived in constant go mode. 
And when I came across this practice of yoga, honestly, at first I wasn't super into it because I was like, this is really slow. <laughs> this yes. is slow, but the stretches feel good. I was an athlete growing up. And so I was like, this is something that's good for my body. And like you touched on in my little bio there, really there came a point in time where life was just so overwhelming. There were so many things that I hadn't recognized in myself so many ways that I was ignoring my own story and who I was. And a yoga practice is really what gave me the stillness and the space to begin to look at some of those stories and to really own who I was and what was important to me. So I don't think that everyone has to do yoga or go to a mm -hmm. yoga class, like a posture class to find that. I think it can be found through prayer, contemplation, even just meditative walks through the woods, you know, Walt Whitman style. Mm -hmm. But I, for me personally, really needed to find a way to slow down. And so that's what ultimately started my journey really to myself. And I'm happy to share more about that, but I don't want to go into a long tangent. No, I think that that's great. And honestly, we'll probably get into that, you know, <laughs> tangent here. Um, and also for those of you who are joining us live, or if you're watching the replay later, please feel free to comment. Um, if you have questions for me or for Claire, or just in general around this topic, we'd love to be able to take those as they come. Um, and yeah, you know, it's so interesting that you mentioned quiet and space. So when I worked with some of the early childhood educators in the state, you know, a lot of like, okay, what do I need? What do you need to, to feel more calm? And a lot of it was like, I just need everybody away <laughs> and I need quiet. Close the mouth. <laughs> I just want everything to be silent just for a couple of minutes. And that's so important. And I, and also I think what's interesting too is that you touched on that piece of quiet and reflection and just kind of si either sitting in that peace and finding that peace, but also sometimes being active with it, of doing an active reflection within that space. And I think a lot of times we don't even realize how many ways we can go about that, right? A lot of times we think of that type of peace and space has to be, you know, a two week vacation without a phone, without a laptop, nobody bothering me. I have to be sitting on the beach and completely unplug. And really it doesn't even have to be that big because a lot of what this is and a lot of even what we do with Be Well, Care Well is really about finding ways to incorporate it into our lives that are sustainable. And sometimes that doesn't look like, yeah, I take two weeks of completely, you know, unbothered vacation. But maybe what that looks like is, okay, I'm going to turn my phone off after I get done with work and I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to set a timer for five minutes. and I'm just going to breathe. And that's it. Even if I think the whole time, my phone's not going to be going off and I'm just going to set my timer for five minutes. And at, the thing is, a lot of times at the beginning, kind of like how you mentioned, it's like, well, I don't know how I feel about this, but I hear it's good or I like a part of it. And it, it becomes a practice. And in time, those little chunks of time will actually add up so much that it ends up replenishing us more than a once a year, two week vacation because we're continually doing it. I would first of all love that two week vacation you're talking about. That I know, right? Incredible. <laughs> I'm down for it. But yes, I think that wellness isn't helpful to us if it can't be integrated really into every moment. And of course, there's tons of benefits to taking time off from your stressful job, to taking 30 minutes out of your day to go exercise or meditate. But even right now, Susanna, as we're talking, I, you know, am doing my best to be in my body and to feel, you know, my feet on the floor, to notice my breath and to do my best to stay out of my mind, like the monkey well, brain, right? Yeah, I was going to say the monkey mind. <laughs> yeah, the monkey mind, which is difficult to do when you're forming words and trying to talk, right? But for me, these little moments of recharging the battery, right? Kind of what you're referring to of replenishing yourself. Those can be accessed at literally any time. Even as you're listening to someone speak, being present with that person, really actively listening, thinking before you open your own mouth, 
those are all ways of you know, guilty. Right. Not saying this I'm, is the ideal. This is the ideal. These are the ideals <laughs> that we're shooting for, right? Mm -hmm. Just practicing finding presence in every moment. That is, to me, where we find these spaces for something new to come up. And it really comes into this place of body connection. And that's why as a personal trainer and like you, a yoga practitioner and teacher, I'm really passionate about putting people into their bodies. I'm a firm believer that exercise is not for losing weight. And you know that's a great side effect or benefit of it sometimes. But really the reason that I think it's so important for people to be in their bodies is because that's the one place where you're not gonna find a lie. The mind comes up with thoughts all day. And I think it's Brene Brown or Byron Katie that has a quote that thoughts are never a problem until you start to believe them because they can be completely wrong. They change moment to moment. And when we're constantly living in our head and trying to run this system all from up here, we lose so much of the intelligence that's in our bodies. And when it comes to this bigger question of finding your purpose, finding your why and your connection to something higher, I really believe that since this is the operating system we have, right? We, we don't know mm -hmm. anything outside of this experience in this body. It all starts with coming into that. The body, like I said, can't lie to us. It's in the present moment. And if anyone is familiar with the work of Bessel van der Kolk in The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. we know that trauma, experiences, emotions, all get stored in a way in our bodies in a very physical sense. And so until we can come into our body and until we can sit with it, even if it's just for a few seconds at a time, I think it's gonna be really hard to access these higher questions of what we want from life. How do we find a greater purpose? How do we connect to that? So just kind of going back into this um, mind-body space, and what's like maybe an actionable item for people to begin to do this work. For me, it's all about the body. And that can be done in stillness, like we talked about, like a meditation where you're just sensing your body in space. Maybe your eyes are closed, maybe they're open because you have 30 kids, you know, out in front of you right. that you also have to be aware <laughs> of. Um, but it can also be done during your workout. It can be done during your hike or your walk. So there's so many ways to access it, which is really wonderful for us because it doesn't take much. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, especially since you have that classroom experience uh, and you talked about the actionable items, there are so many ways, which means sometimes it can be so overwhelming if like you're not used to meditating or maybe, you know, um, you want to up your own prayer and meditation practice. And it's like, okay, there's so many ways that I can go about this. And so I guess I wanted to kind of pick your brain a bit on for someone who wants to maybe ex start exploring this, but they're not familiar with it. They've never done it before. Um, how can they maybe start doing it? What are some specific ways that maybe they can start to implement this? And I'd definitely be curious to hear if you have any suggestions for how somebody can do this while they're in the classroom. Because we know when we take care of ourselves, we can kind of downregulate our systems and not blow our lids in the classroom around the kiddos. But that's a really sometimes. hard thing to do. Yeah, sometimes that's, a, again, the ideals that we're shooting <laughs> for. But then there's the human part. But, you know, I just love to kind of spend the next couple of moments really, really diving into what are the specific things that they can do and, and how can they go about that? Well, first I would say let's destroy the idea of perfection or that there's some magic time, like amount of time or practice that's going to catapult you into this other dimension where it's all love and light and you're just it's in your body. <laughs> well, what am I doing then? I call those moments when they show up just little glimpses of grace and they're fleeting. And that's really, in my estimation anyway, all that enlightenment is really, is just showing up to notice, having this brief little, oh, aha, that 
wow, I really felt that. And then going about the rest of your life because we're not monks sitting in caves. So we're out there in the world. That's what we do. And so getting rid of this idea that I have to find this right practice and it has to be this certain thing or I've got to spend 30 minutes on a cushion every day or if I don't hit my 20 minutes of you know prayer or quiet time in the morning, I've failed somehow. So right away, take that off of your plate. If anyone, again, speaking as a type A perfectionist myself, if anyone struggles with that, give yourself a little bit of grace and forgiveness right off the bat. I think one of the simplest ways for people to begin a meditation, mindfulness, contemplation practice is to simply start noticing. And again, going back into the body, notice through your senses. We have so many ways to be in our body. We can be open to hearing the things around us. We can be tuned into how our stomach and our throat feel. We can notice our feet when we're walking. And even when we're in a moment of action, like talking to someone or teaching a class, we can just be looking at the faces in front of us and hearing our own words as they come out. So to start it at a really simple, basic place, I would begin there, simply noticing what is happening right now, because that's reality and that's where the really juicy stuff is. The thing that, that we come up with up here, not that thinking isn't helpful, not that we don't ever need to be in our mind, we have it for a reason, it's just not always where the gold is and it's not always what's actually happening. In my experience, very rarely is it what's actually happening. So for me, these practices come back to just stepping into reality, even if it's just for a moment at a time. That's where I would begin. And then for others who are like, okay, well, I need something a little bit more than that. That seems difficult to just get into. I think it could be something as simple as, like you said earlier, set a little timer literally for one minute two minutes if you want to be an overachiever, okay? Yep. Set that timer and just sit and observe what comes up. Don't try and turn off your thoughts. That's not necessarily what's happening in most meditation. That is my favorite thing to tell people. I'm like, you're going to think. The goal absolutely with meditation is not to have a silent mind. If you can have that, great. You don't need me. You don't need a teacher. I need to learn from you. It's like the purpose of meditation in a lot of ways is how do we practice allowing the thoughts and detaching from them as opposed to getting sucked into the stories, which that's where the practice lies. But I love when I get to tell people, it's not about quieting your mind. If you have mm -hmm. thoughts, you are still a hundred percent doing it right. Like that's Absolutely. okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I, it reminds me of this example. It was either Michael Singer or Eckhart Tolle, um, in the untethered soul. And I apologize. I just can't remember the author of that book, but he gives the example of showing up to noticing or a meditation practice as sitting on a couch with your kind of annoying roommate. And you're just sitting there and this roommate, your mind, your thoughts, right? Is just talking, 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 commenting on everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some people can get turned off to these practices. It's really disconcerting to quietly sit and notice how crazy this software can run sometimes. And just the things that we think about, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is an annoying person, right? This is someone who is deranged in some sense. The things they're commenting on aren't even important. No problem with that. Again, the machine runs this way for a reason. But when you show up and you start to notice that, I think it really opens up this new space for people to first of all, begin to see that this is always running because it's always solving for something. It's always looking out for the next step and trying to keep us safe and keep us involved in community and relationship, right? So that's going on in the background constantly. But then what you notice when you sit with that in a meditation or contemplation, 
there's something else happening. You're separate from that in a way. And you begin to see that, you know, Susanna is not all these thoughts going on. Claire is not coming up with these things to think. Those are just going at their own pace. But what we are is this embodiment right here, this, you know, beautiful, amazing being that can show up in the world moment by moment, because again, that's all that's real anyway, right? So sitting with that timer for a minute or two at a time and just seeing what's the script, what's going on up here, beginning to question, is it all true? Have I been living my whole life as if all of it is true? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But when you create that space for yourself away from the mind and away from thoughts and you practice getting more into the body and becoming the person that sees, right? Mm -hmm. Not the person that's thinking, but the person who sees all that thinking, it opens up this new space. And going back to just the topic of um, connectivity, spirituality, I think it all has to begin there. I don't see another way around it to show up as a monkey brain who is trying to get, get, get whatever I want, you know, whatever we think our intentions are, however good we think we are, we're trying to get things up here. That's what it's for. And that's not really what relationship is about. And it's not what being in community or finding a higher calling is about ultimately. So that's why those practices are really important to me. That's where I would begin. Yeah, and I think that's a really important piece because especially um, one of the things that I've kind of found when working with individuals and, and staff at centers is a lot of times when people feel stuck in life, you know, when they're like, I just feel stuck, mm -hmm. it typically comes from one of two of the eight dimensions that I see. And again, there's so many ways to look at it. It's just one of those things that I see. Um, and it's usually the intellectual well-being where, but not in the sense of, oh, I'm smart. Oh, I'm taking classes. It's, do I feel like I'm growing and learning and being challenged in a healthy way? Mm -hmm. I might be challenged with a lot of trauma. That's not what we're talking about. But like, and one of the things that I say to bust through that is, you know, maybe get the family together and work on a puzzle get the mind activated, give it, like you said, something to solve and work on, because that is a part of us. However, that is also separate from the other piece that people get stuck with it, which is the spirituality, which is what's my purpose? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the thing driving me? And it's important that those are one, two different dimensions mm -hmm. of wellness that at least we look at, but also it doesn't come from the mind necessarily. There needs to be that space of detachment, healthy detachment from the thoughts, you know, distract the mind with a puzzle over here and then cultivate that space where we can really connect with that deepest version of ourselves and make decisions from there mm -hmm. and find and look into and reflect on purpose from that space. That's kind of the more grounded, the more healthy, you know, depending on whatever type of spirituality somebody comes from that can be you know the the holy spirit the internal you know that can be the higher self with a capital s that can be you know my inner wisdom my divine wisdom uh that can be god speaking to me you know kind of however whatever framework works for somebody that's how we can connect so deeply and you know we have a couple of comments here one i love um the active meditation someone had never thought of that before and a walking meditation is great. I, for the longest time, could not go into silent meditation. I just got so caught up. But for me, I'm very physical. So kind of taking that and going a step further in that active meditation where let me take a walk around the building and let me try to notice and feel every part of my foot. Because then I don't have to try to be you know, silent and still per se, if that's something that you know is causing me um, stress or is a difficult thing for me. It's like, I can focus on my feet and actively be thinking and noticing in that sense while I'm actively moving that sometimes can really help break through and kind of start somebody. And also I would just share with every, anybody who tries this, I wish I didn't have to say this, but it's going to be frustrating the first <laughs> couple times. Like you're going to get, Absolutely. if you set that timer for one minute, you're going to walk away and be like, 
I am more pissed off at myself right now and this sucks and I can't do this and that I want to let you know that is totally normal and that does not mean it's not working absolutely yeah absolutely and yeah let me be the first to say that I show up to meditation practices and um sometimes leave them crying because I just feel either so much coming up during it that I didn't realize I needed to process or I leave feeling like oh what was that even good for like did I do anything at all and I think it's just about having something consistent and ultimately finding something that you can do consistently and going back to the moving meditation, Susanna, I'm so glad you know you brought that up again because there's actually a lot of science to that. For anyone that's familiar with EMDR used in therapy, it's just, you know, I won't get into it. I'm not a therapist. I've just been through plenty of it. Basically mm-hmm. using alternating patterns of your body, like running, where opposite Mm -hmm. sides of the body are moving, swimming, physical activities like that start to turn the prefrontal cortex down. And what happens then is the mind, the thoughts kind of like get out of the way a little bit. And it makes that space for us to, you know, some people call it zone out in a sense. And maybe zoning out is where you need to be. Maybe you need gardening or walking, jogging, something like that to quiet the mind. And there should be no shame in that. I just want to reiterate that again. There's no such thing as perfection here. Everyone's on their own journey with this. And so I never want anyone to think that there's one style of meditation or look of meditation that somehow better than others. I I have people ask me all the time, students, you probably have this too. Like, can I use a guided meditation? Can I, like, is that okay? (laughs) Like, is it real meditation? I'm like, well, are you sitting quietly with yourself and reflecting? Then yeah, you're doing a style of meditation. And there's hundreds of different kinds of meditations out there too. You, You can set a vase of flowers in front of you, use an object, an instrument, instrumental meditation, they call it, And literally just look at the flowers, notice how beautiful they are, look at all the textures and the patterns and the colors, do that for two minutes, even 30 seconds. And that can just be enough to get you out of a moment. Yeah, and I have to say, going along with that, one of my favorites is, um, oh, what is it called? But basically where you have a candle or a flame Mm. and you look at the flame because a flame is so dynamic, right? So for me in my brain, I can follow that and my brain is occupied enough that I can kind of detach and that helps me get into the zone out. So, you know, lighting a candle, one, if it has smell, it's going to pull you into the senses. And two, if you're watching that, it's moving. So Mm -hmm. that brain is satisfied while you can go kind of deeper. So those are great things. And this is my, I, there's no promotion, no sponsorship, none of this stuff, but one of my favorite apps if you're an app person is insight timer i have had it for years it. yeah i'm a yoga like yoga teacher mm-hmm. i meditate most days mm-hmm. i have been able to use the free version for years it has been wonderful no matter how much or how little i've ever made i was always able to access it and to use it there's timers there's guided um meditations in there another thing is sound meditations mm-hmm. where you literally find like an instrumental and you just play that. You don't even have to, you just sit there and listen and let it heal you. And it's fantastic. So um, if you're kind of like, I want to start this, but I'm not sure. And I need a little guidance. Insight Timer is one of those great things. There's tons of other apps as well. So I encourage you all to look into some of those. Um, Yes, I second that. Yes, I know, right? I discovered it. Fantastic. Um, oh, we have somebody who said it's so freeing to know this. Yes, free mm-hmm. yourself from what we think it has to be, where we have to be yogis on a mountain alone in Bangladesh. Like, no, that's not. It, you can, but again, it's not sounds a amazing. Give me a trip to a mountain in Bangladesh. I'd take it. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm glad to hear that because I, I hope that as we're talking, it doesn't sound like oh, you know, this is so like, you can do whatever you want. And, you know, there's so many ways to access it. Like, I hope people aren't uh, really hoping they were going to get some like, this is the way to go, do it this way, (laughs) and you're guaranteed results in 90 days. Right. It's just so true. There's so many ways into it. And 
ultimately going back again to how do we find this higher purpose connection into the body by stepping out of the mind and then what and then something might show up i you i'm sure you find this all the time too mm -hmm. you go into a meditation session and you know you're sitting there and whatever nothing magic happens rainbows don't come out of your ears right but then Not every later time, no. <laughs> you might need to go to the doctor if that's happening <laughs> but then later you just find that you have this conversation or you have this realization standing in your kitchen because you were able to be in your body and process some of the things that were there without even having to do anything, without even having to really try for that. A another brief thing that I'll mention as far as a meditation practice is to not be frustrated when thoughts come up, but also when feelings and emotions come up. And one thing that my mentor, Holly Kreps, has really helped me with over the last couple of years is this practice of welcoming whatever is there. So if you're having a stressful day and you go to sit down for those few minutes and you find anger and frustration and tears are coming up and you're like, oh, this was supposed to make me feel better. And instead, all it's done is turn up the volume. Good welcome that frustration it's reality it's what's happening and there is nothing that's going to come out of you pushing that down and of course there's moments where it's not appropriate right for us to just show all of our emotions but this time to yourself is the place to do that it is the place to greet whatever is there and almost you know the way she puts it is like welcome it in like a child like a loved one like take it close to you hold it feel it and be with it until something changes or you notice something new. So going back to your point of it's going to be frustrating, it's going to suck sometimes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly what we need. Yeah. And honestly, when we're, I mean, if we think about it, most of the time when we are in that emotional state, mm -hmm. think about what we really want. Mm -hmm. Emotions by their very nature come and go. Mm -hmm. If they're stuck, that's something that's happening within us. That's not how they naturally go. And when we're really emotional like that, sometimes all we need is to just be held until the feeling subsides. Mm -hmm. We don't even have to do anything about it. We don't have to act on it right then or maybe how we think we need to. Just welcoming it, holding it, and know that naturally the emotions will come and go like the waves. So eventually this particular wave of it will go and subside and it'll mm -hmm. be okay yeah so. yeah and that there's even a deeper intelligence there once you get beyond the emotion of i'm angry i'm frustrated if you stay with it and if you stay out of story and you don't go to well let me explain why i'm feeling that way well she said this to me and that's why if you stay out of that and keep it below the level of the neck you find a feeling then like a physical sensation in the body, like a pit in your stomach or a catch in your throat. And what you might notice is like, oh, this this is showing up as anger. I feel that anger, but actually I feel deeply insecure. Actually, this is going back to, you know, this experience that's ingrained in my body that I haven't accessed. So, you know, going to finding our purpose, finding our calling until you know your own story, until you can feel that in your body and accept reality, I think it's difficult to find that calling. And then once you have these practices in place, then you can just show up as this more authentic person, in my opinion, and form relationships and be in community, look for your passion, look for what really drives you, and then plug yourself into those places, knowing that you have this access to a deep, deep intelligence in the body that everyone has it has nothing to do with intellect or status or anything else it's all there for us and once we connect to it it really just allows us to make the decisions that we need to find our higher higher calling that's so wonderful and 
we could go on and on. I know. But I know. I know. I was like, oh, we gotta, we gotta yeah, cut it's that fine. Off. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But hey, hopefully y'all got wonderful things out of this. Again, thank you, Claire, so much for taking the time to join us today and just sharing your personal and professional, you know, experiences and your views on this and just kind of having this wonderful conversation with us and sharing you. Your, your knowledge with us. Thank so, you, Suzanne. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, for those of you who are watching, please make sure to follow Curricula Concepts on Facebook and Instagram, just so you can always make sure to catch when our Wellbeing Wednesdays are. We've also included in the comments, uh, Claire has been willing to share some of her contact information. So if you want to get a hold of her, those are down in the comments here. Um, hopefully you were able to pick up some wonderful pieces of advice and information and definitely would love to hear how those go for you. So this has been another Wellbeing Wednesday. I'm your host, Susanna Creep, and I'm wishing you well for the rest of the week. Bye, everyone.